This time, we are going to have Brad talk about 3.x on Tintin, which we publicly refer to as Pebble Classic. He'll get to that. Um, then we're going to have John Barlow talk about the most basic intro to the Health API, which just got released in beta today. Then we're going to have John Garcia talk about time of my life living with Pebble. Uh, then we're going to have Heiko do sort of a group discussion about Rocky JS. And if you have no idea what that is, it's very, very exciting if you like JavaScript. Uh, and then after that, we're going to do a bunch of community demos, but I'll take a break in between those and announce those later. Uh, after the community demos, then we're going to do a raffle. I have a black Pebble Time steal for people in the audience, one person in the audience, and then some rare Pebble pajamas that we dug out of a closet when we moved offices recently uh, that I thought didn't exist, but they do. So you get a couple of them. All right, and without further ado, I will turn it over to Brad. Hi, everyone. So for those who haven't met me before, my name is Brad Murray, um, and I've worked for Pebble for about three and a half years now. I joined during the first Kickstarter campaign. And pretty much the whole time I've been here, I've been doing for more at Pebble. Um, what I want to talk to you today about is called 3x on Tintin. That name probably needs a bit of unpacking. Uh, when we refer to 3x, we're talking about the 3.0 plus uh, line of firmwares. It's our kind of third generation of firmware after the 1.0 kind of time in um, um, back in 2013, the 2.0 time in 2014 with the App Store. And then recently, last year when we launched Pebble Time, we went into 3.0 uh, with Timeline and Infinite Apps and all that good stuff. The Tintin part, so internally we refer to um, the product that you know as Pebble Classic or Pebble or the OG Pebble or AppLight or so on. Uh, we internally have the code name for it as Tintin. So the project that I w was working on is called 3x on Tintin because we're bringing that 3.x series of features and that firmware back to the pebbles that we first manufactured in 2012. So just kind of a, an image of the timeline here. So the, um, in February of last year, we launched firmware 2.9, which was actually um, the first firmware before their second Kickstarter for Pebble Time supported Pebble, supported Pebble Steel. And then we pretty much switched gears entirely over to firmware 3.0 um, with the Kickstarter and launched that only for Pebble Time and Pebble Time Steel. And we kind of stranded our users back on firmware 2.9 for our Pebble and Pebble Steel users. And then ever since we launched that, the, the Pebble Time and the Pebble Time Steel, we've been working on bringing firmware 3.0 to absolutely everyone. And we recently did that with shipping firmware 3.8 to absolutely all of our products back in December. But in the meantime, there was about a, a 10 month gap where our old Pebble and Pebble Steel users didn't get any firmware updates, which is probably the longest gap by many times over since we've become Pebble, basically. So why, do we, so why do we do this? Why do we continue shipping firmware to these devices that we first started building and selling in 2012? Uh, the big thing is that it's because we've always done this. It's super important to us that when you buy a watch, that's not when we stop interacting with you. We continue to improve the software, change the experience, fix bugs, and, and basically rebuild everything on, like month over month, and we want to share that with everyone. Uh, the other thing that, we, uh, that we're looking at this from is from the developer standpoint. So we wanted our developers to be able to build apps easily for the entire Pebble user base, whether it's color, whether it's black or white, whether it's round, whether it's square. And part of that means that the software that's running on all these devices is roughly uniform in terms of what APIs are available or how it works. So, but then if we're so dedicated to this, why do we stop in the first place? And the reasons for that are pretty are very largely technical. And this is kind of where the, the talk takes this wicked technical swing where I'm gonna go through um, why we stopped supporting uh, Pebble and Pebble Steel in the first place and all the work that we had to do in order to bring it back so to understand this, to, um, starting out, you have to understand kind of our architecture a little bit. So there's three different types of storage on Pebble. Uh, there's our RAM, which is just like the RAM on your computer. It's used for storing the data that you manipulate while your watch is running. There's the storage flash, which is this big, slow chip that's hanging off on the side of the board that we use for storing fonts, we use for storing images, um, kind of uh, static data that, um, that we want to display on the screen, and it tends to be very big but this storage is kind of slow. And then the part that we're gonna talk about most today is the system flash. So this is a piece of um, flash memory that's stored right in the microcontroller itself, and it actually stores the firmware itself. 
So whenever we ship you a firmware update and we write all our code and we compile it into this blob and ship it to you, that's where it gets installed to and that's where it runs out of. So to put some numbers beside these things, um, for, for Pebble and Pebble Steel, the numbers are all the same. For Pebble Time and Pebble Time Steel and Pebble Time Round, the numbers are all the same. So there's kind of these two generations of product. And uh, you can see for Pebble Time, all of the storage is roughly double. And the biggest thing, the biggest roadblock to us during this time was that system flash um, space. So um, when we were developing our software for Pebble Time, uh, we ended up running up against that limit in order to enable all the new things that we wanted to enable for firmware 3.0. And we ended up basically creating a firmware that was too large to even fit on Pebble. And this is something that we monitored all the time. We knew that it was uh, gonna be a challenge. And um, early this year, we decided that uh, it was gonna be very hard for us to ship firmware for all of our platforms due to the, to the, the growth in code size requirements. The funny thing is that this was not a new problem. So I'm not sure if you can read this all that well, but I decided to dig through my email today and kind of look through the code size history at Pebble. And actually the first time that we ever run a, ran out of code space was actually November 28th, 2012, according to my email. So before we even shipped 1.0, before we even um, shipped product to end users, we we're running up against that 512 kilobyte limit. And it continued to be a thing, a constant challenge for us as we continued adding features and rewriting parts of the operating system. So um, I think this is really a testament to like kind of our long time, long term fight with this kind of issue, where um, when we started out in 2012, the, the feature set was much smaller than it was today. And only by continuing to optimize our code base and um, continue to learn how to be more effective with the limited resources that we have that we were able to continue um, shipping firmware. But it really came to a breaking point in firmware 3.0 kind of time frame. So this is a number I pulled from June. Our firmware code base, when you tried to build it for a black and white watch, no voice, no color, it ended up being about 650K, which is 40% too big, like it's way too big. And in order for us to actually ship it on Pebble time, we were going to have to knock this way down. And that's, that was the challenge that was set out before us. So how do we do it? There is a bunch of different parts that go into this, and I'll go into each one of these in turn. Um, first of all, I'm going to talk about the bootloader. So the bootloader in the firmware um, lives in the system flash of the chip. So you can kind of see how it's divided up there. Um, in our Pebble products, there's about half meg of RAM, 512K. And it's split up roughly for 64K for the bootloader and 448 for the firmware. The bootloader is actually imaged onto the factory, and it never changes. And it's the very first thing that runs whenever you reset a watch or power it on. Um, so it's responsible for booting the firmware, um, doing firmware updates, or booting our recovery firmware, which you're probably familiar with if your watch has ever died on you. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, and the thing that we kind of realized as part of 3X on Tintin is that actually 64K is way too much. Like this part of our system that we can't upgrade um, because it's the thing that does the upgrading is wasting all of this space. So in order to actually do this, um, actually a question, how many people have actually migrated a Pebble or a Pebble Steel to 3.0? One, two, three, a few people. Um, do you recognize this little icon in the bottom right corner? So when this icon is showing up, this is actually our migration firmware running. So what we ended up designing is we uh, wanted to install a firmware that you had to install to a 2X or a 1X watch in order to enable it to be upgraded to 3.X. And it does a few things. The main thing that it did is it updated the bootloader to take up less space. Um, it also updated the PRF, so you no longer have the old 1.5 recovery firmware that we built many years ago. You have the newer graphics, the more stable um, kind of workflow. And it also migrated all your data for you. So the, the, the hope was that you would just connect your mobile app you would install this migration firmware, and it would actually preserve your Bluetooth keys through this migration process so you wouldn't have to repair your phone, even when we're changing everything about how your watch works. And this is roughly what it looks like. So basically, you had a, a watch that still had this big, fat bootloader on it. You would download this migration firmware that would boot like any other normal firmware, but it was kind of a Trojan horse, and that inside of it, it also contained a new bootloader that, to install and a new PRF to install. 
and this migration ran. It showed that hourglass, and while that was going on, your bootloader was changed, your, firm, your PRF was changed, and then you end up with the layout at the bottom where you boot the new PRF, and we have all this extra space available for us. This is kind of a one-way thing, and it was something that was very nerve-wracking for us. We've never updated a bootloader in the field. It is the thing, it is our safety net whenever things go wrong. It's the thing that puts you into PRF when things go wrong. And it was a major challenge in order to make sure that this process was super robust and we can trust it on the hundreds of thousands of watches and users that we have out in the field. Um, some other details that we kind of went into. Um, so LTO. LTO is a compiler technology called link time optimization. And what it allows you to do is it basically takes all of your code across your entire code base and rolls it up into one ball and then optimizes that entire ball all at once and allows basically your firmware to be mashed down a lot. <laughs> um, this is kind of a newer technology. Um, LTO is kind of rolling out into GCC and Clang in the past couple of years. It's not like everything else in the CU ecosystem and decades old, but it, it actually gave us a lot of space and not quite for free. We had to do a lot of work in order to enable this, but it was another thing that we used in order to knock down the code size that we were using up. We also wrote our own standard library. So the, the thing that in the CE ecosystems provides you your mem copy, your printfs, um, your basic math functions, we ended up writing this ourselves because we realized that we have different requirements from a lot of other projects out there. So we didn't care about backwards compatibility with any other platform. We just knew that, so a lot of the libc's out in the field wanted to make sure that you can run it with a, 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 a program that was developed decades ago. We didn't care about that. We're doing an entirely new thing. We didn't need all that baggage. We didn't need floating point support. Um, Heiko, a couple years ago, talked about code size and how to optimize your app for it. And floating point is just very expensive from a code size standpoint, and we just didn't need it. And we also just don't really care about performance all too much, except for certain very hot spots. And we can really optimize this for, for space and not for performance. And then unfortunately, the other thing we had to do is cut features. We had to look really hard at our feature set and say, um, will this be a compelling product if we cut this out? Can, can we still deliver a lot of value even though we're missing some of the, the glitz and the, the, the things that you love about Pebble? So we had to cut out the animated icons. It was sad to see them go. I love that little nuke. I love that stork that, or what is it, an ostrich that sticks his head in the ground. I miss the sloth. But um, unfortunately, they had to be uh, culled. Um, <laughs> we also moved back to the older style launchers. The new launcher with the, um, with the, the big um, icons, that's actually much more expensive for us to implement and get all the animations right and make it look really beautiful. So we had to switch back to the older 2X style of launcher and also simplified a lot of the animation. So you'll notice not everything is twisting around as much, but things are more simply sliding around. And those are not um, because we think they're better, they're actually cheaper for us to implement. And unfortunately, the point at the bottom is that Pebble and Pebble Steel don't support health. And that's not because we hate our Pebble and Pebble Steel users. That's because that feature is actually really expensive to implement. It's so much more than the app that you access on your, on your watch. It's actually a, a, a large code base that's dynamically analyzing all the sensors in your watch to understand when you're, when you're walking, understand when you're sleeping, and we just couldn't fit it in. There's other, a bunch of other work too. Um, a lot of rewriting, a lot of refactoring, building out new technologies. I kind of listed a few of them here, but I would really like to kind of share more about what the firmware team does at Pebble um, going forward. And I think we're actually gonna start doing a, a more engineering focused blog um, coming up soon, where we're gonna talk about some of these technologies that we're building inside the firmware code base and sharing it out with the larger world. So stay tuned for that. <laughs> and then mostly like, I'm a firmware guy, um, so this talk has been heavily biased about what the firmware team did, but it really it was like actually a very large effort. So there's a lot of work on the mobile side to make onboarding smooth so that you can just download the app and all of this migration process was seamless to you. Um, all the work on the developer side, building tools that allowed people to build apps that worked across all the platforms, um, distribute their apps easily through the app store um, to allow them to support both of their 2X user base and their 3X user base easily and then going through support guides, marketing it to everyone, QAing it, it was a massive effort. And really it was the first thing that we started doing as soon as we shipped Pebble and Pebble Time, or sorry, Pebble Time and Pebble Time Steel back in May. So um, team was probably about six, 
to 12 people throughout that time. And it was a really large effort from us in order to crunch all this in. But we knew we wanted to do it, and we knew we wanted everyone to come back to this, um, to this common ground. And it shipped. We made it. <laughs> so the first date there is that timeline for Pebble Classic Beta, which is kind of a mouthful. Internally, we called it the 3X on Tintin Beta, where we allowed people to sign up on our Google Plus page and get early access to the firmware. Our main goal with that it was to figure out the kinks in the migration process. The whole idea of updating the bootloader, changing PRF, bringing people smoothly through this really like upsetting kind of process, we really wanted to make sure it was robust. And the best way we thought we could do that is not only testing it internally, but rolling it out to a few hundred or a few thousand people outside the company. Um, luckily for, well, not luckily, but thankfully it went smoothly. And we ended up shipping it on December 15th to absolutely everyone. And if you have an old watch, it's available for you. It's our latest and greatest, and I strongly suggest you go check it out. And actually, we're going to continue doing this. So firmware 3.9 is just around the corner, and it will also support Pebble and Pebble Steel. So Pebble and Pebble Steel are brought back in the family, and we're going to continue to support them. So that's all I had today. Um, hopefully, you understand a bit more about what went into that whole 3X on Tintin project. I, I, think you, I hope you understand a bit more about the challenges we kind of face as a firmware team for this tiny resource-constrained device. And um, I hope it was interesting. Thank you. Any questions? Or you can always talk to me afterwards as well. I'll be here all night. Yeah, the, the question was basically about um, what, what's on the horizon as far as compiler support as, as to make these kind of things easier and what kind of things we can take advantage of to make our, our code smaller, make it run faster, make it easier to develop. Yeah. Yep. So I think Heiko is probably the best to answer that question <laughs> um, as far as future language support on Pebble and how we're making it easier for developers. Um, on the compiler side, we do keep an eye out for what kind of technologies are coming down the pipe. Um, unfortunately, there isn't, um, for, the, for a lot of these very low level stuff, we're very much forced into kind of the C kind of environment because that's the stuff that's most applicable to the problems we're kind of solving. And we're actually kind of unique in that not a lot of other products and firmware developers and engineers in general um, care a lot about code size. So a lot of the times, compilers are speeding up how they optimize for performance and make faster code or make it easier to write, and, but, not, but not size efficiency, especially. So um, we're keeping an eye out. We're trying to push, um, like do a little bit of influencing to make other people care about code size. But um, we're trying to drive it ourselves as well and trying to build the technologies we need to, in order to continue to go down this path. Cool. Thank you.